So first of all, thanks to the Science Museum of Virginia uh, for this opportunity. Thank you guys uh, also for attending. So uh, I'm at VCU, as Tim Schull mentioned, and what I wanted to do today is just um, tell you about some really cool things that you guys can see in nature. Uh, and uh, I do want to have a little bit of a disclaimer. A lot of this stuff is not my own research. These are things that I'm interested in, and I hope you guys will be interested in when we're, when we're done. And uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, even after the talk, you know, I'm just going to have like a whole bunch of examples. And so if you want to delve a little bit deeper, if there are things that have piqued your curiosity, feel free to email me after the talk, you know, and I can, I can point you to the papers or I can point you to other websites that might, you know, give you a little bit more information. So I have homework for you. So I know this is the easiest way to... Uh, endear myself to an audience, right? Uh, so, uh, but uh, the teacher in me uh, thinks that it would be fun. Basically, my homework to you is when you guys go out, take a look at what's around you, pick up stuff, and you find something very interesting. And I hope that some of the uh, examples that I present to you today uh, might give you some inspiration, might uh, show you things that you might look at in a slightly different way, um, and maybe you, you'll find some new examples of your own. And, you know, I think that would be, uh, my, uh, that would be my homework for you guys. And uh, so it can be various types of things. So, you know, over uh, quarantine, you know, I've been uh, taking walks uh, with my daughter. Uh, we found these pine cones uh, right uh, behind my house. So uh, there could be things like this, which I think you might find pretty fascinating. So uh, if you guys take a look at a pine cone, you know, you would see that uh, you have something called a Fibonacci series, right? All the number of spirals around a pine cone. And so this pine cone that I found a couple of days ago uh, has uh, 13 counterclockwise spirals and eight clockwise spirals. And you guys can go pick up any pine cone and you should see pretty much the same thing. And it turns out that eight and 13 are what are called Fibonacci numbers. So that's just a number that's obtained by adding the previous two numbers. But what makes this even more interesting is if you divide 13 by eight, you get what is called the golden ratio, 1.618. If you go look in a sunflower, so if you were to go and pick up a sunflower and look in there, you'd see the same thing. So if you go and look and count the number of spirals, you'd see the same thing. And if you've got a pineapple over the summer, and you looked at the number of spirals that it has, it's the same thing. Or you could count the number of leaves. So there's like all this type of cool stuff out there, and I hope you guys can go in and find some of this stuff. Now, is it useful? Maybe, maybe not, but you know, I think it's fun. Or maybe you could go to one of our favorite spots here in Richmond. I think you all know where this is. This is the Virginia Museum of Fine Art. And uh, if you look there, there is right now, this was a picture that I took on Sunday, fantastic day. Uh, and you can see that there are, um, there are lily pads or lotus leaves. And I'll show you more examples of what this is all about. But one of the most interesting things, if you were to drop a little bit of water on one of these lily pads, you're going to see that it rolls right off. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's called the lotus effect. And we'll see how this is useful for making different kinds of things. And so that would be something that you could also look at. So here are some other uh, things that you could look at. Maybe you'll see this. Does anyone know what this is? So this is my little question that you can put in the chat or if you, uh, uh, and then maybe Tim Schull can to read off a couple of these things. And uh, does anyone have an idea of what this is? Oh, so what is that everybody? Go ahead and type it in the chat if you have a guess, and then I can t I can uh, relay that. And I'll also show you a picture right after that. And this is something that was inspired by this. And it looks so, like that. Oh, Ooh, so we what's have that? Um, seed pod, dandelion, plant, uh, uh, fruit, uh, a cattail, like the type of plant cattail maybe. Yeah. Um, a burr, a thistle. Burr. 
some type of carnivorous plant. Oh, it's yeah, that, that would be nice, right? Those wonderful yeah. carnivorous plants. Well, it isn't. Well, I heard the so magic that's what we word. Got. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, awesome. It is a burr. It's actually called a burdock burr. And this little picture right here, this is Velcro. So many, many years ago, there's, there was this gentleman who was an engineer walking his dog um, in, the, in the woods. And what he found was that this burr would attach itself to the fur of his dog. And so when he looked at it, he found that it had this little catch and release mechanism and you guys can see that right at the edge of the of the burr and so that inspired him to design this guy which pretty much all of you may have in somewhere and that's velcro so that's one of the examples that you know you could see that led to something really really cool that pretty much everybody on this planet is using just because he looked at this sort of catch and release thing and then he designed Velcro out of it. So this is another thing that perhaps you could do. So all of this that I'm giving you examples of is what is called biomimetics. This is the science of imitating nature, okay? And this was the word that was introduced way back about 50 years or so ago. And it is this whole idea of looking at nature and using that to get inspiration, to get ideas, to design sustainable things, to design efficient things, and to basically you know, solve these wonderful problems that we are having around us and then try to find creative ways of solving these problems. And so that's something that I hope many of you may be inspired to do as, um, you, know, as, you, go, as you go around. So if you look back in mythology, you know, so this is mythology that you know, people talked about many, many years ago about imitating nature. So this is the story of Icarus. So I think uh, some of you may be familiar with this one. So sorry for the gruesome image, but Icarus was given these wings that he had to, to put on so that he could fly. And his father told him, hey, you know, don't go too high because the sun is going to melt the wax that holds the wings together. But don't go too low because the sea foam is going to get in the wings and then you're going to sink. But you've got to be at the right height. And so in engineering, we call that optimization, right? But what did Icarus do? Icarus started flying and then, you know, he got so excited that he flew higher and higher and higher. And what happened? The sun melted the wax on his wings and plush, he fell into the ocean. So I guess when I, talk, when I tell this story to my students, I say, hey, you know, the moral of this story is you have to listen to your parents, right? But the idea that I wanted to share with you is this, uh, this, this concept of looking at nature and trying to form different things from it, you know, has been around for thousands of years. Every time we look at nature, we try to get different ideas. But what I would like for you guys to think about is think about inspiration from nature, not necessarily imitation, okay? And so I'll give you several examples of this in the coming slides, and I just want you to think about nature as a model. Here are some pictures that I hear some really interesting things and in just to start off. And so you look at this, this picture of these birds that are diving into the water, okay? It is, I think it's one of the most amazing things because if you think about it, what is the bird doing? The bird is diving into the water so that it can catch the fish that are underneath the water. So when it's flying, it looks under the water, it sees the fish. Now remember what happens when you put a straw in water, the light causes it to look bent. And so the bird is actually able to calculate based on where it is, looking into the water where the fish actually is. It's not where it appears to be, but in a certain specific place. And so when it dives into the water, it actually makes these calculations. So when I think about birds, I actually think that they're extraordinarily smart. And when birds can do this kind of thing in a split second, I think it's really impressive. So of course, when we look at birds, we think flying. And so here are some other examples. You know, what about the shape of the bird? They're really aerodynamically efficient. So that's something that scientists and engineers are very interested in doing. 
They're interested in making things more efficient so that they can use less fuel, so that they can go better, they can go quieter, they can go further, they can go faster, things like that. So that's one example where we're using inspiration. Yes, I have a question. So let me answer that. Does, did, uh, did anyone, if you had a question, well, oh, let me just- Yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, at the moment, um... I have uh, lots of people saying they're really enjoying the talk, but no specific questions yet. Cool. Yeah, we'll continue. I'll give you a, I'll give you a second or two to, to pause, and then you can ask a few questions just in a couple of slides. So the other part of this puzzle is that you can actually get materials from nature, and that's actually something that my group does, and I'll show you some examples of that too. What we want to do is we want to get things from nature and then use them to make different kinds of devices. So I'll show you that a little bit later. Now, one thing that I do want to caution everyone is that it is not necessary that everything that is great out there in nature can lead to wonderful things that we as humans can use. But at the same time, the idea is to just look out there and see about these, these different kinds of things. And sometimes that distinction is a bit gray. So you know, looking at the, you know, like, for example, honeycombs, beautiful things, you know, those hexagonal things that you see, what can we do with that? There are some times where it's useful, sometimes it isn't, whatever, right? So here's the big classic idea that, you know, the bird that we've been talking about. So I'll give you some, I'll show you some examples of this. And so here is a really, really cool idea, that nature inspired design. So many of you, if you've been to Japan, You've seen their super fast trains, uh, and we have them too, we, but maybe they're not as fast. But if you look at what is most interesting about this train is look at the shape of the front of the train. So there was a problem about 20 or 25 years ago when Japan first had these trains. Now these trains traveled really fast, but the problem was when the train was entering a tunnel because it was traveling so fast, it started to compress the air in front of the train. So when it came out of the tunnel, you would hear like this huge explosion, like boom. It was a, it's similar to a sonic boom that you might hear, but slightly different, but basically it's kind of like that. And you could hear this for like half a mile away. Now, every time a train passes by, if you keep hearing these explosions, I mean, that made a lot of people quite upset. So what happened? So this engineer, Eiji, he looked at his other hobby, which was looking at birds. And there you see the kingfisher, which is one of the most, uh, was one of his favorite birds. And he looked at the kingfisher and he looked at the way it would dive into the water. Remember the diving bird that I showed you? It looked into the diving bird and looked at the way the kingfisher was diving. And he figured that, hey, if I could design the front of the nose of this train to look like this, perhaps it would be more aerodynamically efficient. And lo and behold, they went through many iterations and that's what led to this particular idea of engineering based off a bird beak, okay? Here's another example. This is something that you might be familiar with. And uh, if you go out in the country, you see that there are barn owls. Now barn owls are nocturnal creatures, right? They hunt at night. But one of the most interesting things about the barn owl, if you were to ever watch it hunt, is that it swoops in really, really quietly. So if you've got a little mouse or you've got some other little animal that it wants to hunt, this is a predatory hunter that swoops in super quiet in the dead of night so that it can catch this prey. How does it do that? Now, if you were to actually go and look at the feathers of the barn owl, which this company did, they found that it has like these really, really interested, interesting serrated feathers. And that's what allows them to be so quiet. So based on this idea, this is a company out in Europe. They designed these fans that have these little serrated wings so that when they turn, they're not only super quiet, but they're also much more energy efficient. So this is an example of barn owl based fan design that's out there right now. Okay, time for a question. So if I were to ask you, what is your favorite color and why is it not blue? Or why is it blue? That would be one thing, right? But I want to ask you this. What do you think 
is the rarest naturally occurring color out there? Wow, that's a great question. All right, guys, if you want to put that in the chat, what you think that might be, I'll uh, gather those. Uh, now, what I mean by old. rarest is it doesn't re you don't really actually see that. You see this, maybe you see this, uh, I don't want to give you any hints, I guess. You see it a lot, but it doesn't occur naturally as often as you think. Um, I've got uh, some blacks, a couple of turquoises, uh, mm. purple, orange, um, a lot of blacks, a lot of blues, oh, green, copper. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, mauve. Oh, oh wow. Uh, uh, pure black. Uh, pure. Like, okay, yellow. Black isn't a color, is it? Purple? Black is the absence of color, interestingly enough. Yeah, so like we've got some really interesting comments. Um, yes. So all right. Wonderful, guys. Really great guessing. Good, good ideas. So I'll tell you the answer, and the answer, which some of you mentioned, it's actually blue. Believe it or not. Yes, you know, the sky is blue, the water's blue, right? You look around, you see blue everywhere. But the interesting thing about blue is that natural blue pigments are extremely rare. And if you look, you look at flowers, you know, there's like thousands of flower species, right? Less than 10% of them are actually blue. And I'll tell you something more about blue in the next few slides, but it's really, really interesting if you think about it, that blue pigments are really, really rare. But you see a lot of blue stuff out there, so where is it coming from? And we'll get to that in just a second. So some of you mentioned uh, red, you know, red and orange, by the way, they are, when you eat a carrot, so kids, when you eat your carrots, that's, w that's where you get the red and orange pigment from. They're carotenoids, the same word that's found in carrot. And you also have, for instance, a flamingo, it turns pink because it eats these specific kinds of little shrimp that make it pink. It actually is born gray and turns pink. Now, browns and blacks, by the way, they are fairly common. So if you look at, you know, uh, melanin, which is a pigment that we have in our skin as well, that's an example of something that causes blue, that causes browns and blacks and things like that. Yellows are common. And actually, many of the blues that you see are combinations of these pigments. So naturally occurring pure blue pigments are kind of rare. So what is happening when you actually see the blue color? out there. So here's one of my favorite butterflies, which I think many of you have on your phones. I guess it's the butterfly emoji, right? It's the blue morpho butterfly. Now the blue morpho butterfly is actually not blue. And the reason it's not blue is because of its very unique structures on its wings. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. But if you were to change that in some fashion, and that's how it plays with light. And this is the reason the sky appears blue. The sky appears blue, not because it's blue, but because of something called scattering of light. And that's what happens when light gets scattered by little dust and little things, water and all sorts of stuff that you have out there. And that's why the sky appears blue, right? In the case of the morpho butterfly, if you were to disrupt the wing in some fashion, like this little picture that I have here, in this case, what we did is you put a little bit of alcohol on the wing and you see that, hey, it turned green. And that's because what happens is the structure of the wing changes and so does the way it looks. So this is something called structural color. And you see this a lot in nature. So when you see a lot of things that are out there that look blue, for example, they're not really blue, but they appear blue because of their structure that allows light to be scattered or reflected or refracted differently and make it look blue. And so there are several examples of this in nature. And this is something that is one of the most fascinating things that people are interested in. And this is because, now think about it, maybe one day you could have this on your house and you know it would be, you know, you would have this beautiful paint that is natural, you know, paint tends to be somewhat toxic and there are a lot of these chemicals that are used in paints and so on. But you think about nature, it has all these wonderful things that are biodegradable and sustainable and all of that stuff. People are interested in using this idea to make structural color 
because first of all, you don't need to use pigments and things like that. And second, they last for a really, really, really long time. Now they tend to be a bit fragile, but they do last a long time. People, when they went into the pyramids, you know, after four or 5,000 years, they looked at the beetles that they found in there. They were shining like the day they were put in there for thousands of years. And that's what makes us so amazing in nature. And that's what some of the reason why people are so interested in structural color. So let's dig into the morpho butterfly quite literally. If you were to go in and look deeper and deeper. So this is something called a scanning electron microscope. It's a very specialized microscope. If you want to ever see one, come down to VCU. We have one in the Monroe Park campus. You know, it's you can look at it. I, I don't think you can use it, of course, but you can take a look at it. It's really cool. It allows you to look at really, really small things. And when we're talking about small things, we're talking about things that are called the nanoscale or the microscale, which are smaller than the width of a human hair. So a human hair is about 100 micrometers. So we're talking about things smaller than that. And light is at about 400 to 600 nanometers or so. And this is what happens over here. So if you were to look in this morpho butterfly, look at these little beautiful scales, right? You go deeper and deeper and you, what do you see? you see these really, really interesting looking structures there. And what happens is these structures, they play with the light that's put on them and they reflect back blue, which is the color that you see with your eyes. And that's what's called structural color. Interestingly enough, now if there are some of you with blue eyes, the blue in your eyes is not from a pigment either. It's because of a similar kind of structural color. So it's one of these really cool things. So if you were to look at things that are blue out there, like the blue jay, you might be thinking, hey, blue jay, that guy's got to be blue. The blue jay, actually, its natural color is coming from melanin, which should make it look black or dark. But because it has these little air pockets in its feathers, here's an example of another bird. Because of these little air pockets in its feathers, it reflects the blue color, it reflects the color that makes it look blue. So there's another bird called the Kutinga bird that also looks this vivid blue color just because of this. So the peacock feather, another beautiful example. So if you guys have ever looked at these feathers, they're made from things called, they're made from a protein. It's called keratin. And it's the same protein that's found in your fingernails and in your hair. And chicken feathers are made from the same protein. And Peacock feathers are made from the same protein. It's called keratin. And the way that these guys are arranged allows them to appear different colors. Now, feathers are all fascinating in many other ways, and we'll talk about this in just a second. But way back, about four or 500 years ago, when Robert Hooke was the guy who was credited with inventing the microscope, he wanted to look at all of this stuff. He actually wrote this book and uh, some people say that it was the first scientific bestseller out there. And what he looked at was he looked at these beautiful peacock feathers, and you can see these kinds of things. And so they also have peacock feathers have something called super hydrophobicity, which we will talk about in just a second. So this brings me to one of my favorite birds out there, which is called the bird of paradise. Now, you guys can go check this out on YouTube. There are some really cool videos. Uh, Sir David Attenborough, of course, a personal hero of mine, uh, has these beautiful series. There's one out there on Netflix and uh, on various whatever your streaming choice is. But this is the bird that does this beautiful, elaborate mating dance. So the male bird of paradise in this particular case, in all of these cases, it's the male bird that tends to have this beautiful plumage and it does this dance where if you look at what it's going on is that it has these feathers on its breastplate right here in front of the, the bird. And what it does is that it does this elaborate dance uh, all to impress the female bird. And you can see what's happening in this particular case is that by playing with light and by positioning itself in the optimal way towards its target, the person or the bird that's trying to impress, it can create this beautiful plumage. And that's again, 
just not because there's any pigment, not because there's a blue, a blue color in its feathers, but simply because of the way these barbules are arranged that then allow it to appear blue or iridescent or something like that. So what if you wanted to make white? So I said blue is great. Now we said black is the absence of color. White, interestingly enough, is the presence of all color, right? So when you reflect everything, it appears white. When you reflect blue, it appears blue. When you reflect nothing, it appears black. So this particular beetle that's out there, it actually has this really, really thin layer on its, on its ex exoskeleton that reflects light and it makes almost a perfect white. So it's another really, really interesting thing. So when you look at all these things out there, when you guys go out and look at bugs and look at all these stuff, I hope you look at some of their colors and look at their feathers and look at their, their wings and so on. And I hope you can see you know, how sometimes it comes from a pigment, sometimes it comes from a, uh, sometimes it comes from reflection of light and sometimes it is, a, and sometimes it's a combination of all of these kinds of things. So anti-reflective coatings. So if you were to ever look at a moth or a butterfly and you look at some of their wings, you know, they have these compound eyes, right? And what happens in many of these cases is they have these little tiny hairs on little tiny nodules on them, and that allows them to be anti-reflective. Now, this is very useful if you wanted to make some kind of a solar cell that you want to have very high efficiency. And so people are interested in this, and this is a field for some of you, it's called nanophotonics, where what you're trying to do is you're actually trying to play with the structure, not by using paint, not by using pigments, not by using dyes, but you're playing with the structure to make it look a certain way. So in case you were wondering, is there a blue butterfly out there? There is, there's just one, or just maybe a couple. You'll have to go all the way to Brazil or to the Amazon, and you'll be able to see this guy, one of the very few animals out there. There's a very, very tiny set of animals out there that are actually blue. A blue poison dart frog is one of them, is an example. And this particular butterfly, which is out there in the Amazon, Obrinia olive wing, missed a chance right there on the last name, but that's actually got this little blue pigment. But by and large, if you were to see a blue butterfly, it comes from structural color. So oh, before I move on, I wanted to pause for a second and I'll any, any questions that yeah, anyone? Yeah, we've got a number of questions uh, from this segment. Um, one question from early on is, was uh, when you were talking about just introducing the blue structure, structural pigment was, um, does this have anything to do with why veins appear blue in your skin? Um, so veins appearing blue, I think that's, um, I'm not 100% I'm not, uh, sure, but that's, uh, I think it's also a function of its, uh, of its reflection. It's not, I mean, uh, um, because of the way, so I'm, yeah, I, I'm not 100% sure on that one. I do know that, like, for instance, if you were to put light on your finger, it's going to appear red because red travels the deepest in skin. And so blue light generally doesn't travel very deep, but red goes through. And so that's one of the reasons why, you know, if you were to put a flashlight on your finger, you know, it appears red. So, but I'm not 100% sure why veins might appear blue about that. That's a good question. Maybe I should look it up. Email me. I'll find the answer and email you back. Um, somebody asked about, uh, also along these same lines uh, during this part of the talk was, uh, has anyone ever tried to design a dynamic paint? Uh, they clarified as a material which changes its color toward, according to a demand. Yes, people are, work, are working on this. Yes, there's absolutely a really great interest in this. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll give you some examples. You know, I mean, there's the, I think somebody was talking about black, right, earlier. There is the, there is the, uh, there's something called Vanta black that's out there. It's a color. You can look this up. It's like the blackest black you can imagine, you know. And so remember, again, what, what you're trying to do in the case of black is that you are basically preventing light from, from 
reflecting. It's absorbing all the light there. And so there is a, there's a car that they painted with this particular thing. And there, is, there are efforts to make these kinds of color changing or color shifting type of objects. I think one of the big challenges in this, as you can imagine, is that these types of structures also tend to be very fragile. And so there is a challenge right there when you're trying to make something that is cool like this in terms of iridescence and so on, also trying to make it very stable. And so you can, you can picture the butterfly. It's so fragile, right? It's so delicate. And so it's, it's kind of difficult when you're making these kinds of nanostructures and so on to also put it in out there in a commercial device that people can touch and manhandle in some cases and so on. And so there are great interests, but there are, there are other challenges from an engineering perspective that you have to consider. Another person asked about um, black bare fur, like black furs that sometimes appear blue. And is that because of a scattering of light or structure of the floor, fur at the time that you catch that image? Yes, that's a great example of something that is a scattered, uh, that's a scattered uh, light. I mean, and so sometimes it is because of the way that the light just simply plays off of the, of the fur. Uh, and I think I had one more. Oh, somebody asked about um, when you mentioned the butterfly that has an actual real blue pigment, were there any uh, examples from the plant world? Like, a, is there a true blue flower? Ooh, yes, beautiful. Yes, that's a great question. Yes, so there are. So, I mean, maybe I think first thing you might think of when you think of a blue flower is, hey, bluebells, what about those, right? So, yes, there are a few blue flowers out there. But again, the number of blue flowers that are out there is very, very small in comparison to the all the other colors of flowers that are out there. So there are very few blue flowers out there, but they do exist. And so an example is blue flowers and so on. So, But when you see a blue chrysanthemum, for example, that is a color that has been bred in. That's not real. And that's been generally formed by a combination of colors. So that's another thing that happens a lot in nature is that it is not necessarily blue because of a blue pigment, but it is blue because of a combination of a couple of pigments that make the color blue. And, no, and so that's why it appears blue. Nice. All right, I think we're uh, uh, mostly caught up. Cool. All right, so uh, again, just uh, please go ahead and look up some of this stuff. I, I'm sure you will love to see it because I know that one of the most popular colors out there, of course, is blue. Uh, unless you ask my daughter, who said would say it's pink, but uh, you know she. But but you you would definitely be able, fascinated by some of these things that you know you might assume were to be true about the color blue, but actually comes from structure. So here's the next part, little thing that I wanted to show you stuff about beating of water. Remember I showed you the VMFA, you looked at the lotus leaf and so on. And what is the meaning of beating of water? So, and why is it so important? So right now, you know, it's raining. And so if you were to go look at your windshield, you would see that, you know, the water doesn't necessarily pool up, right? And so it tends, when you see that water pools up, it tends to spread. But when it beads up, something about that surface is causing it to beat up. So this is a phenomenon called hydrophobicity, which is where it doesn't like water, hydrophobic, or hydrophilicity, where it likes water. So you have water-loving surfaces and water-hating surfaces. So when you look at ducks, so if you were to go to Maymont and you look at the geese and you look at the ducks, what do you see there? You see that they are able to be dry. And this is because the feathers Allow, to keep, allow them to be dry. Now, the interesting thing about feathers is that sometimes, yes, they are coated with this waxy substance that makes them appear dry. But in many cases, again, it's because of the structure of the surface. So here is an example of what a lotus leaf actually looks like. So if you were to look at a lotus leaf, what you would see is that it has these little tiny structures. Again, these are called nanostructures because they're so small, they are a hundred to thousand times smaller than the human hair. And because these little structures that are there on the leaf, they prevent the water from spreading and instead cause it to beat up. So this is called the lotus effect. So why do people care about this? Hey, there's a good example. Uh, I would consider the problem in the right-hand corner 
to be one of the most vexing problems facing men, right? I mean, how do we get that ketchup out of the bottle, right? So we want to get that last bit of ketchup, but then it keeps getting stuck. So people are working on this. Now, I mean, I'm, I'm being somewhat uh, facetious, of course, but there are interests when you think about it, when you're trying to transport oil through a pipeline, for example, you would like for that oil pipeline not to get clogged. You would like for your drains and your sewers not to get clogged. So are there ways in which we can solve this problem, not by putting chemicals or by putting different types of things or waxes or oils on them and so on, but is there a way that we can actually change the structure? And there are people working on this. This is a bit more of a complex issue than we can discuss, uh, but we think about it like that. And so here, obviously, you know, you can also make self-cleaning surfaces that, you know, when you pour water or when you put dirt, when you have something that falls on it, instead of spreading, what happens is that it simply beads off. So this is called a self-cleaning surface. And you know that they already exist. You could buy self-cleaning pants and stuff like that. And in many of these cases, remember, you, you can't have it just work once, right? You have to put it in the washing machine and you have to have this many times. So that's the problem when you have something that you coat versus something that is actually structural. So this is also very useful in the animal kingdom in the concept of water harvesting. And so there are these beautiful beetles out there in the Nabib Desert that allow the water to beat up and then that allows it to get its daily supply of water when water is a very scarce commodity out there in the desert. And these same kind of hairs are really fascinating. They allow things like water striders to walk on water. You can also find that in your pet cat. So if you were to look at this pet cat and you look, and you look at the tongue of the cat, you see something very cool. Now, this is something that you might find in a domestic cat all the way up to big cats, lions and tigers and jaguars and so on. You see these little things called papillae. So these hairs are a design motif that appear a lot in nature. You see them in plants, you see them in animals, you see them with, with you serving different kinds of functions. And so what the cat does is that the cat is then allow, it allows it to clean itself and so what it's doing is that it's actually spreading its saliva through its fur using this kind of hair in its tongue that allows it to spread it clearly across its fur without damaging the fur and then allowing it to clean itself. So this is something that perhaps people are interested in making special kinds of brushes for grooming your cat, for example. So how do we do that? The same kind of hairs are what allow geckos to climb walls. So you've got these little things called setae that then allow the gecko to be able to climb near vertical walls. So what? What about it, right? Why? From an engineering perspective, you can, of course, design these self-cleaning surfaces, like we said, but you could also design robots that could then climb walls. Again, think about it. It's easy to stick stuff to a wall. It's easy to peel it off, but try to do this many times. That's the engineering challenge. So you think about a post-it note, for example. How was the post-it note invented? The post-it note was invented by chance. That is when they found this glue that really didn't work so well. And they were like, hey, this glue doesn't work so well, but maybe I can use it for a post-it note. And so that's how it came about, right? So you've got this idea that you can stick and unstick and stick and unstick without using much force. And the way that the gecko does it gives us this beautiful inspiration to design these kinds of wall climbing robots that people are interested in for various kinds of things, including rescue in a fire and so on. Looking closely, you see these little kinds of hairs and they're also interested in making these kinds of adhesives for surgeries, things like making these things attach to different types of surfaces by simply, they're not chemical adhesives, they're not epoxies, but they have these little hairs that then allow them to stick. And this is something that you might see on your next trip to the beach. How do mussels attach themselves to rocks? You think about it, they get smashed by these huge waves, right, coming in all the time, and yet they don't come off. How do they do that? And they do that because of these wonderful wet adhesive technologies that actually come from the very important chemical 
that all of us have in, our, in us too. It's dopamine. It's actually a derivative of the chemical dopamine that regulates our own nerves, nervous system. So it's a very interesting bit of chemistry out there. And there's a lot of beautiful research out there in which people are trying to design these kinds of wet adhesives. Wet adhesion is kind of difficult. You think about it, the next time you want to stick something, one of the first instructions that you see is wipe surfaces clean and dry. Why? Because most adhesives don't work so well underwater. But we don't have to only think underwater. Think about when you have a surgery or something like that. Things are wet. There are wet environments. How do you get stuff to stick? So that's something that where you can use these kinds of beautiful technologies to do that. All right. Time for quiz number two or three. What nice. is your favorite marine animal? All right. Go ahead and type that in the chat. I'm just going to say mine. Mine's an octopus. Oh, beautiful. I love octopi. They're my favorite thing in the whole wide world. We've got sharks, curl, corals, uh, marine, bi marine iguanas, uh, seahorses, whale sharks, giant squid, uh, uh, another squid, a dolphin, a bunch of dolphins, octopus like me, uh, sea otters, I love it, dolphins, cuttlefish. Beautiful, sea otters, great creatures. Uh, great white sharks. Dogs of the sea. A lot of dolphins. There's some great ants. Blobfish. Oh, the blobfish are so cool. Cuttlefish. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Personally, I think the blobfish is beautiful. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, a lot of really good answers. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this is great. I mean, you know, I, I think you know, I just wanted to, to uh, I, I just wanted to hear what people think. It is really great when you look at these beautiful, wonderful things that we have out there in our oceans and seas. And I just wanted to introduce you to a couple of them. This Tim Schultz, you one of your favorites. This is one of my favorites, the octopus. I love the octopus, and I think it is one of the most fascinating creatures out there. And when you think of color changing, I think the first thing you think about is the chameleon, right? Octopi, um, I think plural octopi, octopodes have been told. Uh, the octopus can not only change color, it can also change texture. That is something that is extremely fascinating. And that is something that people have looked at. This is probably one of my favorite TED Talks out there. I would encourage you to look at it. It is by David Gallo. And in this, he actually goes and looks at this octopus. And if you look very closely, you think it's a coral, but it's actually an octopus. So what the octopus has done in this beautiful case is that it has camouflaged itself to look like the surface that it's on. Now, this is amazing at so many levels. It has changed its color. It has changed its texture. It has changed its shape. All of this by simply observing its surroundings and making it look like what is there. How do we do that? How does it do that? And this is something that people are so interested in. We want to be able to design these kinds of dynamic surfaces that can adapt to their surroundings. And the octopus is one example of something that might be able to help us in this regard. And these suction cups can also help us design these kinds of beautiful, of these adhesives like we were talking about in just a second. Now we can go on and on about these examples. As I said, you know, I would love to discuss many of these things and we could really literally talk about these for hours, but I just wanted to give you guys just a flavor. When you look at the next time, you look at a squid, you look at any of these crustaceans, you look at these, these, this, the, these uh, arcs, think about them, think about what you might be able to find about them. So sharks, of course, everybody loves sharks, right? And then, course we are scared of them in many ways and there are there are small sharks there are big sharks there are giant sharks and sharks one of the interesting things about them is that they have no bones they're cartilage and that's something that's very interesting about them and of course i think maybe the other thing you may also have heard about these sharks is their teeth what they are able to simply replace them right all the time they one set of teeth comes out the next one comes in and so on so I wanted to point one particular little story about the sharks 
and this is uh, something that you know people have tried to make so that you can swim more efficiently. But one of the more interesting things about the shark, which is really a engineering uh, marvel in many ways, is if you were to look at the shark skin, shark skin is extremely fascinating because if you were to look very closely at the shark skin, it has what is called this plate-like architecture or placoid architecture. And this placoid architecture is what makes the shark skin not only very efficient as it glides through the water, but also, interestingly enough, it is an antibacterial surface. It's also an antimicrobial surface, and there are companies working on this. And so this is an example that I thought many of you might find fascinating. This is something that, you know, we don't work in directly in my lab, but we're very interested in this kind of stuff because we're actually able to make a medical device now um, using this principle. So the way that the placoid architecture is arranged has provided inspiration to this particular company. Now, just a disclaimer, I'm not endorsing any of these products. I just think it's an interesting thing. You can look it up. It's a company that basically makes these kinds of, of medical devices that you can use. Now, this is something that people have been very interested in. And nowadays, I know all of us are going through large quantities of hand sanitizer, right? So we want antibacterial surfaces. We want antimicrobial surfaces. And so one of the ways that you can also do that is by making these kinds of things that you can put on. So here's an example that I found from the company that allows you to put this adhesive backed tape on a door so that every time you touch the door, you're actually not being able to, you're not leaving behind a bacteria or you're not able to, or you don't get infected by, by some of these things that are out there. This is something that is very, uh, very, uh, it's a big problem that people are interested in solving. And it's not just because of COVID, but antibacterial or bacterial or uh, resistance to antibiotics is a very big problem in the 21st century that many scientists are interested in. And so designing these kinds of things, looking at nature and using that idea to design these kinds of antibacterial surfaces can be something that would be very useful. So people are interested in making these kinds of things. So I, I just wanted to show you how sharks can inspire design in many ways, not just in the swimming side of things, but to biomedical stuff whales and things that people are looking at. So this is something just like the bird, the barn owl, remember that we looked at? The whale tubercle, every time it cuts through the water, it does so in this amazingly aerodynamic, I guess, hydrodynamic way. How does it do that? And so using this idea, there's a company that is out there. Again, these are just ideas. Some of these things may not make it to the marketplace. Some of these will. So, but the idea of looking at nature and trying to make better windmills, for example, this is something that they've base, they been inspired by, is by looking at the wings, looking at the fins of the, the, the whale, and trying to design these kinds of tubercles that then allow them to make a more efficient wind turbine, for example. So I'll show you a couple of examples of the super strong materials. And uh, this is something that I find extremely fascinating because it's close to my research. Do you know that we, the bones in our body are almost exactly the same architecture as a bamboo plant? Now, if you were to look at a bamboo plant, you'd be like, hey, there's nothing similar to that in our bone. But if you were to actually look inside the structure in which the way that these things are arranged, there is an amazing similarity between our bones and bamboo which are both very, very strong structures. And the reason they're very strong is because they're something called hierarchical architectures. Nature builds from the bottom up. And that's something that I guess is another take home message that I have for many of you is think about things being built from the bottom up. And that's what nature does. When you go for your beach vacation, look at shells, the same thing. You have these little plate-like structures and the way that they're arranged in this hierarchical fashion allows them to be super strong. And so that's how knacker, which is also our mother of pearl, is formed that allows it to be so particularly strong. Here's a parrotfish that eats coral. And here's one of my favorites. It's the Mike Tyson of the sea. I want you to look very closely at what this little shrimp does. Uh, it's tiny but it packs a punch, no pun in, or pun intended, I guess. So if you look at what it does, 
it basically has like this right jaw or right uh, punch that it just essentially punches the crab and knocks its arm off. And it's really amazing because if you were to actually look at this, this is a lot of engineering going on here. But one of the most interesting things is that the arm that it punches with has a very, very specific architecture in which these things are arranged that allow it to be so super strong. The woodpecker, how does it do this? The woodpecker keeps pecking away at wood and yet, you know, they don't necessarily suffer concussions. And this is a problem if you're watching football, you know, people are very interested. Of course, you want to be able to design better helmets, not just for football, but also for riding your bike and so on. And so people are trying to use this idea. And in the case of the woodpecker, it is amazing that what it's actually having is this little, its tongue wraps all the way around its head. And that's what provides this particular cushioning effect. And then of course, there's also the spongy bone that it has in there. And so people are trying to design better helmets using this concept derived from the woodpecker. The toucan beak, similar kind of thing. And in all these cases, what's so fascinating is that these are designed not from metal, they are designed from proteins. Keratin, again, the same thing that makes up our hair and bones, our hair and fingernails, it's the same thing that makes up this beak. It's super strong, it's super light. How can we as engineers use these ideas to make these kinds of things? So that brings me sort of to the last bit of my talk, which is one of my favorite things because this is what we do a lot of research in. And what comes to mind when you think of the word silk? Let's see. So what, what comes to mind for folks? Uh, I've got moths, moths, threads, dresses, strength, uh, soft and smooth, pretty fabric, uh, cool. a couple spiders. Yes. Uh, <laughs> spider webs. Uh, Wonderful. Worms. Yes, that is beautiful. Um, this, uh, flexibility this... and parachutes. Awesome. Lots of good stuff. Strong. Exactly. It's super strong. And I think it's really cool. And I, 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 I just think when you think of silk, you think of so many wonderful things. And of course, one of the things that you may be thinking about is Spider-Man, right? I think, and uh, you know, it, you, a person, you just think of when you think of silk, you think of wonderful clothes and everything. And you also think of spider webs and you think because they're made from the same silk. So it turns out that, yes, you're absolutely right. Spider silk, and silkworm silk are the two different kinds of silk that you might have out there. And spider silk is, of course, what gave rise to or inspired Spider-Man. And if you look in nature, it's actually not an exaggeration. You have these beautiful spiders that can spin webs that can go across rivers and that can allow them to be transported across rivers. And, and they can also, of course, make different kinds of webs that you see everywhere. And so the spider silk is one of the most interesting things because not only is it super strong, like many of you have mentioned, it has also got inbuilt sensors in it. So the spider is sitting right there in the center of the web and it knows when a insect has landed on the web as opposed to wind, for example, that can also cause the web to vibrate. So it's got these little sensors in them that allows it to figure out that, hey, time for dinner, right? So the spider silk is very, very fascinating. And we work in, our, in my lab in the, case, in the area of silk. And we're very interested in using these ideas to be able to def use them to make different kinds of devices. We don't work with spiders, but we work with silkworms. But I do have a lot of friends who work in spider silk, and here's an example. And this is something that people are interested in doing. Now, there is a problem, of course, that spiders are cannibalistic. So you don't have spider farms. So you've got spiders do not like to be with other spiders. So if you want to raise spiders, you'll have to have them by themselves. You cannot make them be together. And so you don't really get that much out of it. And so this is a company out there that's actually making spider silk using bacteria. And so what it does is that it, gen it genetically engineers the bacteria to make these spiders silk or the same kind of material and then use it for different kinds of things. And so this is a company called Bolt Threads and it's really, really interesting. You can buy ties and stuff like that. And I love this, this little tag. 
it's 100% spider silk made by humans. So you've got, uh, you've got all these little ideas that are out there. And so I'd like to conclude by my, one of my, this is my life uh, we work on. We do a lot of research in this little guy and what, what we can do with the silkworm silk. Uh, this is of course a little silkworm. Uh, he is working very hard as you can see, making his little cocoon. And it's a very interesting process because what he's doing is that he's got these little glands on the inside that then take the liquid dope silk and then when it comes out, it comes out in the form of this super strong, super amazing fiber that you can then use to make a scarf or you can use it to make other types of stuff. Like in my lab, we use them to make electronics and I'll show you some pictures of that. So this is what it does. It essentially spins these little things. It results in a cocoon. But what is so interesting about this cocoon is that the cocoon is actually made up of a protein and you can use this protein like what we do in my lab. And this is work that we do in my group. If any of you are interested, you know, feel free to reach out. What we're trying to do is we're trying to design electronics based off of this silk. Why are we doing this? The reason we want to do this is because we're motivated by not only the amazing properties of this material, but we're also motivated by the idea that na nature derived materials can help us address various different things in sustainability and degradation. So when you throw away something, imagine that you could make this device that you use, you love and you so on. And then when you're done with it, you throw it away. But what happens to it is that it simply disappears and goes back into nature. So you're not generating any waste, but you're simply making it sort of like go back. And that's something that we can do. And many people are interested in this field as well. And so what we do is we make very, very fine electronics and different kinds of structures using this type of thing. This is a picture of my student. He's got a little patch on his finger. You can look on his hand. You can see it says VCU on there. And you can use this for making different kinds of skin sensors, which are really something that we're working on right now. Um, we're also looking at things like chitin, uh, which is the stuff that is found in shells. So next time you eat shrimp, you throw away the shrimp shell, but that's something that you can actually collect and use it to make something interesting. And that's some, that is called chitin. And chitin is also the same material that makes butterfly wings. So you see these ideas, they all show how things in nature can come together and we can use them, not only for inspiration, but also as a material. And one of the things that we're motivated by along with a lot of people is, hey, can we use this material? Can, my, can I use the shrimp shell to make an object like wrapping or like Say so that I don't have to use single use plastic? Can I use it to make different kinds of knives and forks and straws so that, I, so that we stop using these single use plastics that are responsible for so much plastic pollution in the oceans these days? And so that's something that we want to look at and that's something that we're motivated and I hope some of you out there can come up with similar ideas and come up with ways to address some of these different challenges that we have in the 21st century. So with that, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that I was able to uh, have this opportunity to spend time with you guys, tell you about some of these things. I was telling Tim Schill, you know, I can talk about this stuff for hours. You know, we've got several examples. I am a collector. If any of you have cool ideas, send them to me. I collect these, these ideas. We talk about them to different schools. We talk about them in our classes. We want to be able to show how you can use nature to do different kinds of things. And so I hope that many of you may be inspired when you go out into the, for your hike, when you go out on a walk on the beach, when you have your, when you look around and see things that you can use and look at wonderful things, the hummingbirds and nautilus, the dragonfly, butterflies, peacock feathers, lotus leaves, seaweed. You know, I'm sitting here with, you know, under the sea, as you might've imagined with seaweed and seaweed actually produces this material called alginate that we use a lot in tissue culture. So, you know, it's a wonderful thing. And of course, many of you may have had seaweed at your uh, sushi restaurant. So there's all these things that you can do. So uh, without much ado, you know, you can, there are additional resources. Please visit the museum. They have some really cool um, uh, exhibits on many of these things as well. And when, when they open their doors, do visit them. So with that, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, a lot of uh, very complimentary uh, c uh, comments, uh, by the way. Um, uh, a lot of thank yous. Uh, I don't want to keep folks too long, um, but I had two more questions. Uh, one that just came up uh, was, uh, what is the typical degradation time of the silk sensors you were working on? <laughs> Good question. Yeah, we actually, uh, we use something called an enzyme to degrade them. And so we can control that. So right now, my, uh, we are able to make them degrade in two weeks, we can make them degrade in two months. So we have ways of controlling that. And that's something that we are very interested in. And you know, how do I make devices with controllable lifetime? That's something that we, we really are very interested in. Uh, and the last question is um, that I'm gonna, we have time for today is, um, excuse me, uh, how close uh, are we to seeing some of these things that you've talked about, like the antibacterial surfaces uh, being ready for production? Yeah, the antibacterial surfaces, as I understand it, are already out there. They, they, are, uh, they are selling them. And so many of these things are out there on the market. Uh, some of them are in beta testing. Some of them are in, you know, sort of like similar to clinical trials. They're in like phase two and phase three because you have to do various kinds of safety testing on many of these things. You have to do long-term testing. And so there are, there are various, they're all in different phases out there. But I do know about Sharklet, you know, and Sharklet does have products that are out there. They're, they have catheters in the market. They have adhesives that are out there already in the market, so on. Well, that's awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Vamsi, thank you very much for an awesome presentation. I've got a lot of comments that have said they're really looking forward to looking at the world differently when they go back outside. Wonderful. Um, so that's what we want to hear. Um, uh, thank you guys again for joining us next week on Wednesday at noon. Um, our own state geologist will be talking about gold in them Zara Hills right here in Virginia. So uh, stay safe, everyone, and stay dry today. Bye, everybody.